Well, let's get into our study tonight. We want to talk about the spiritual gifts. And I feel like so far what we've done is we've, uh, we've put a lot of facts out there. And we haven't really drawn a lot of conclusions yet. I want to try to get to the conclusions, but I feel like we've got to, we've got to lay a, a bunch of foundation here to help us understand the subject. So we know, of course, that, that the church is designed to accomplish Christ's mission on the earth. And uh, that's what the church is here for. It's the body of Christ. It's the pillar and ground of the truth to carry on the message of Christ, the truth that Christ uh, came to declare. And uh, to do that, the church was given the Holy Spirit. And we know that the Romans tells us that if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we're none of his. Uh, every child of God, every, everyone who's saved has the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit enables us to do what God has for us to do. He enables us to carry on the work as we band together in the church. None of us can do it by ourselves. The Holy Spirit doesn't enable you by yourself to do the work of God. He, um, he enables you as a church. You'll give one person something uh, that will benefit, uh, that will accomplish one, one thing, and someone else will give something else that will accomplish another thing. And as a church together, we band together and we accomplish the work of God. This is what spiritual gifts are. And really, as we mentioned already in this study, anything that we have is to be used for God. And in that sense, it's everything that we have is given to us by God is, and is a gift from the Holy Spirit to us to be used for Him. And so we even see that spoken about several times in Scripture. We mentioned it before, where the gifts that we have are mentioned just in a general sense, like everything we have. Uh, but then there's more specific gifts, and we talked about the three lists of gifts in Ephesians and in Romans, and then we've, we've sort of settled on 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, because um, the other gifts, there's not really a lot of controversy about. They're, they're not miraculous things. They're, they're things that we see today, very obviously, there's not really a lot of debate. But in the list of gifts that were given in Romans chapter 12, uh, 13, and 14, we're given uh, several miraculous gifts, especially the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. And so we sort of pause on Romans 12, 13, and 14 to talk about these two. And we've just given a lot of facts about this, this what we see about prophecy. We didn't really bring any conclusions yet. And today I want to try to talk a lot about the tongues. And then maybe we can get to some conclusions. We may do just a whole next week, all conclusions, because we'll finally start to be able to wrap some things up. But remember that in the Bible, we see that miracles are signs. It's, it's always, the, the word miracle and the word sign are in, interchangeable in Scripture because miracles are to prove something. They're to prove the work of God, to prove that this is taking place. Uh, so re, keep that in mind that miracles are signs. They're, they're used that way. They're referred to that way all throughout the Scripture. We've talked about it several times in the book of John after John writes all, uh, you know, his whole gospel about Jesus Christ at the, in the very last chapter, he says, and many other signs did Jesus, many other miracles, m miraculous things that are signs to show who he was, that what he was saying, what he was teaching was not just some new thing that some human being came up with. And this we need, right? We, we need to know that what we believe when we're, when we're believing the Bible is not something we believe just because some guy told us to believe it. I heard someone today, actually at the Bible study, the men's Bible study this morning, say that they, you know, were trying to tell someone uh, in their family about about the Bible and about about the Scripture, and the person responded by saying, "Well, that's just a bunch of stuff that men wrote down." And I thought, well, first of all, everything you know from history is just stuff that people wrote down. You know, it doesn't mean it's false because men wrote it down. But at the same time, we have proof for the Bible, and it's not just because men said so. It's because we have eyewitness testimony of miraculous events, such as the resurrection, prophecy of the Old Testament coming that came, very clearly came true, and so many other eyewitness testimony to miraculous things. The miracles are the proof that this is a supernatural book. It's, it's written by God through men, not just by men. Right? So that's, that's important. Remember that miracles are signs, and what we're asking now is not whether or not spiritual gifts continue, because we all know that the Holy Spirit is still here, He's still working, and He still gives gifts to His people to accomplish 
his work. The question is, do the miraculous spiritual gifts that would also be called sign gifts, because that's what miracles are, they're signs, are the sign gifts still continuing today? And you say, the, the, well, the cessationists, uh, uh, which would be us, we would say that, well, the, the sign gifts have ceased. Um, and then there's the continuationist or the or charismatic. The charismatic would say, uh, no, the, the, the miraculous gifts continue. And they, they would argue, well, you don't have anywhere in Scripture that says that the miraculous gifts are going to stop. Um, and so we're going to ask the question uh, when we get all done, why don't we have a place in Scripture that says that the miraculous gifts will stop? I think we'll have a good answer to that. But let's put that on hold. That probably, probably when we get there today. Let's talk about tongues. And But first I want to just uh, wrap up and conclude the, the section on prophecy. So remember that um, miraculous gifts um, and signs are, are the same. I think we already covered that. Let's talk about uh, when we talked about prophecy, we talked about how the word um, that's translated proph- prophecy, the word uh, prophetuo, um, means to foretell or to tell forth. It's something that someone is declaring as true, whether it's something before it happens or just something that they're just declaring as true. It's very much the same, uh, similar to our, our concept of preaching. You know, they are just declaring something to be true. Um, often they would be called prophets if they heard the apostles prophesying something and then they went and took that same prophecy that the, prof- that the apostles prophesied, a, a future event, and then declared it to their church when they went to their church, you know, because the, pro- the apostles weren't at every church, right? They would then be called the prophet, even though it didn't originate with them, right? Because, um, because they're declaring, they're forth-telling prophecy. So um, we, we know that, there's, that when we're talking about prophecy in Romans, we're not necessarily, we're not really talking about something that is 100% miraculous. There, there certainly would be some miraculous element to the prophecy that they would have back then. And we have a few examples of that in the, uh, in the book of Acts, where um, a group of, of uh, prof, prof, prophecy ladies, <laughs> uh, sisters, all come and prophesy. Um, and, uh, and Paul is told that, uh, that he's going to be bound when he gets to Jerusalem, right? There, there's a prophecy that comes about, about the apostle Paul. There's a prophecy about a, a, a famine that's going to come to Jerusalem. And we're not sure where that prophecy originated, but it was told to the people in, in Antioch, to the church in Antioch, by, by someone who is not an apostle. But he comes from Jerusalem. Maybe he heard it from an apostle. Or maybe he, he was given to it, it, it directly by the Holy Spirit. So we know that there was some prophecy during that time that was miraculous, foretelling something that was going to happen. We also know that that's not everything that prophecy was. We saw in um, we we saw that according to First Corinthians four fourteen three and four. We'll turn there just to get get us started here. Um, I don't know why I'm in Romans, so give me a second. I got to turn to First Corinthians. In First Corinthians fourteen uh, three and four, we saw that there are three purposes for prophecy. He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and to exhortation and comfort, which is different than he that speaks. In an unknown tongue, he edifies himself, it says. Um, so there's edification, exhortation, and comfort. Those things do not demand uh, miraculous, a miraculous prophecy. You, you can have prophecy that's not miraculous, that can be edifying, can be um, exhorting and comforting. Um, the word um, also is used um, in contrast uh, with, uh, with miraculous things. So we know that it's more than just miraculous prophecy because um, in uh, verses like uh, verse 28 of, uh, of 1 Corinthians 12, it says, And God sent some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, and then gifts of healing, governments, helps, diversities of tongues. So miracles is separated from prophecy. So if all prophecy was miraculous, then you'd think that those would be together. Um, apparently not all prophecy was miraculous, or at least that would be a good, uh, one good um, thing to draw from that. You also have other passages like in chapter 14, where you have another list, verse 28. Um, oh, it's not verse 28. I've, I've, got it, uh, I've got it mixed up here. Let me see if I've got it written down. 
I'll find it. I'll find it. But anyway, we, we talked about it last week. I don't want to go over too much um, over old stuff. But basically, you have this in contrast with miraculous and gifts of knowledge and gifts of other things. So there's, if, if all prophecy is just supernaturally knowing future events, then it wouldn't be distinguished from these other things, right? And because it's distinguished, it means that there's at least something else in prophecy. And we know that, of course, because the word means not just to foretell, but also to tell forth, to say, to preach something. Okay, so here's a co- conclusions we can draw about prophecy, and then we'll get on to tongues. So one may determine that the gift of prophecy exists today. Uh, you can come to the conclusion that the prophecy exists today and still not conclude that miraculous gifts uh, continue today because prophecy wasn't 100% miraculous back then anyway. Um, so it was not always miraculous. Um, it also, we know that it was given um, part of prophecy, part of the job of the person who had the gift of prophecy was to sit and judge other prophecy. I don't think that was miraculous. I, was, I think that they're judging it based on what was already revealed in prophecy. That's not a miraculous part of the gift of prophecy. And also, it was subject to judgment, which means... If it's all just this miraculous thing, you know, why are there people sitting there judging it? Well, that's because they have to check your, what you just said is prophecy with what the apostles said and make sure that it matches up. Because if it doesn't, then it's no good. And so we come to the conclusion that according to Jude 3, by the time Jude was written, Jude said that the faith, meaning the body of doctrine, was once already delivered to the saints, meaning everything that we believe uh, as Christians, was already delivered to the saints. Now, at the time of Judah, it hadn't all been written down yet. There was a, still the book of, of Revelation, probably, that hadn't been written yet, and so, so on and so forth. But it had all been delivered to the saints. Like Everything that we believe today should be found in, before Jude, right, in, in the church, or else it's not part of the faith, the, the, the whole complete faith that Jude said was already delivered. So if prophecy today is to be judged, what is it supposed to be judged by? Well, it should be judged by what's already revealed in the Bible. So we have to ask this question, can prophecy today be judged by what is revealed in the Bible? Well, most of the prophecy you have today is not about end times things. It's about, oh, uh, God gave me a word for you, Christy. He said, you're going to get a million dollars this year, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, just some, something like that. Well, how are you going to judge that by the Bible? How, how can you even judge? How can you sit and judge a prophecy like that? That's certainly not the type of prophecy that they were giving. It was a prophecy that could be judged. Um, and, and, and furthermore, if it is something today, now that we have the, the completed revelation of Scripture, if prophecy today is something that we can judge in the scripture, then all you're doing is telling us what the scripture says. You're not giving us anything new, right? If you do give us something new, we're going to deny it because we're judging it by scripture and that's not found in scripture. Do you understand? So prophecy doesn't, wasn't required to be miraculous back then and it wouldn't be necessary for it to be miraculous today. In fact, if it was miraculous it was some, and it's, it was something beyond what scripture says then we would have to reject it because we're supposed to judge the prophecy. So that's kind of our conclusion about prophecy. So you're seeing now how, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we're, we're able to show that, that at least when we're talking about prophecy, that doesn't seem to fit that we would have miraculous prophecy today. Now let's look at tongues and see if we can find the same thing. And I think we're going to find very similar conclusions about tongues. Now, uh, these tongues, uh, the tongues were clearly sign gifts. They were gifts that were signs. Now, all, I think all miracles could be called that, but there's no question. You can't get around the fact that tongues were for a sign, um, which means that they're, they're uh, for a certain time. And, and we'll, we'll show, I'll show you how I come to that conclusion in just a minute. But if you go with me to the book of Acts, you'll see where the tongues begins. If I can find, I can't, I just can't turn in my Bible today. I don't know why that is. Acts chapter 2, um, we'll start in verse 3. There appeared, this of course is the day of Pentecost, you're probably very familiar with it. It says, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like, of, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
So each of them began to speak in a different tongue. Right? It's not one person who is being heard in every different tongue. It's all of them speaking in different tongues. Right? And it says, and they were all, uh, verse 5, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. They were there for the day of Pentecost. Jews, but they were from all over the Mediterranean, all over the known world. And they spoke different languages, and they came, and no matter what language they spoke in their home t- in the world, or home, hometown, or whatever, p- home part of the world, there was one of the apostles there speaking that, uh, uh, speaking that language. And they're thinking, how do these guys know our language? They're, they're Galileans. I mean, they're, they're, they're not learned men. They didn't go out and learn a language. You see how this miracle proves, you know, it was very obviously proof that this was a miracle. It was evident that this was miraculous. It, because they, were, they weren't just speaking gibberish angel tongues. They were speaking things that other people knew to be other languages and could understand them. And the, they knew that these guys could not have possibly learned those languages. So there is proof then that what they're saying is miraculous from God and it's a sign that their message then is from God. You see how that's a sign. Let's continue on. It says, Now when there was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Um, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Perga and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and Strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Uh, Others mocking said, These men are are full of new wine. Well, explain to me how they're learning new languages because they're drunk. I mean, how does that? That's not how that works. Now, you you do the tongues that we see in churches today, tongues. um, Yeah, you could speak those kind of tongues if you were drunk. Matter of fact... (laughs) You know, when I watch Andy Griffith and I see Otis drunk in the jail, he sounds a lot like some of these guys. Anyway, it's verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. They'd be drunken much later in the day. <laughs> so it's only the third hour. We'll be drunk later. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, this is uh, that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You see, this was a sign. This was a miracle. And he's going to go on to read the prophet Joel. We're going to talk more about that later, so I won't uh, read it right now. It's clear that these are signs. We see it again in Acts chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22, uh, since we're, you probably still have your finger there, it says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So the tongues are, pur- are on purpose. They are a sign to prove to those who don't believe that this message is true. Now, what we have when the message is first coming out, we need miracles to prove that this new doctrine is, is actually from God. It's not just something that these 12 guys concocted in a lab somewhere, you know. They, it's got to be something real. And we know that because it was proven by miracles when it came out. Um, the question would be, do we need continued miracles today? Now think about how whenever God does a new work and teaches a new thing to his people, it's accompanied by miracles. Look at Moses, right? You have the ten plagues. You have the, the opening of the, of the waters to lead the, the people out. They're following the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. They go to Mount Sinai and there's like, you know, there's smoke and lightning and, and hail and, and a voice of a trumpet. And then God says, I've got something new for you. It's called the Ten Commandments. Now, it's not that they weren't to be following the moral law of God before that. But God was giving them something new to write down. Uh, Moses was going to write down the scripture And they needed to know this wasn't something Moses just went up to a mountain and made up. They needed to know this was actually from God, and so it was proven. Did God continue to part the the Red Sea and to send plagues all throughout the history of of Israel? No, 
He did miracles from time to time to show that, uh, you know, um, to show that a certain prophet was, was speaking from him and to show that this was happening and show that. Um, but he didn't continue to prove that message back from back on Mount Sinai because there wouldn't be any way to prove it with miracles afterwards. It was the miracles were needed when it was being delivered. So we, were, we should expect miraculous things when the New Testament is being written. If, it's, if we don't see miraculous things when the New Testament is being written, then we have a good reason to throw it out. But because we do see miraculous signs to prove that what was being written was from God, now we can accept it. Do we need continued signs today to continue to accept this? No, because we're not writing the Scripture. Those signs were given uh, co- uh, in connection with those who were delivering this truth. So that's expected, right, for, for tongues to happen during this time, okay? Um, now, we know that in 1 Corinthians 14, in the, in the church during the first century, we know that there was requirements about tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm good on time. I thought I'd be out of time by now. Okay, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40. He says, let all things be done decently and in order. And this is his conclusion after talking to them and giving them all these requirements about tongues, he's saying, you guys are disorderly with your tongues. You're just, you know, getting up and speaking in tongues whenever. By the way, if you ever watch a charismatic service, I mean, some of them are more than others, but it's just going to be random, like, gibberish out all of a sudden. You're like, what was that? What? what? And, and then it goes back to, you know, English, right? And, and then random gibberish, and then what, what was that, you know? And every now and then, on, in some of those services, somebody will stand up and interpret angel tongues. But how are you supposed to know if they're giving you the right interpretation? You know, they used those same syllables last week, and it meant something totally different. And, and also, the thing that the angel is saying, you know, the thing that the person's saying in angel tongues is, is something they could have just said very easily in English, because we're all English here, you know? And you haven't proven anything to me because all you're doing is speaking in gibberish. It doesn't prove to me that you know angel tongues or that the Holy Spirit's actually speaking through you. It doesn't prove anything to me. And you're not getting a message across to me that I didn't understand before because now you're speaking it in gibberish. You could have just spoke it in English, right? And what, you know, what they say, you know, these, these interpretations are, Oh, the Lord is with you. Be strong and have a good... Gr-. I'm just thinking, just read the Bible. That's right there in the Bible. You don't need to speak it in this gibberish angel tongue. See, that's not the, not the way that Paul wanted tongues to be taught in the church. He said, no, no, listen, everything decently and in order. If there's going to be someone speaking in tongues, they need to stand up. They need to find someone who can interpret that tongue to the rest of the people, and which means that it would have to be an actual tongue, Right? Um, so, and, and if there's no one there who can interpret it, then they just need to keep silence. Whatever it is that the Lord's putting on their heart that they know is going to come out in a different language isn't going to help anybody if nobody knows the language. If there's nobody here who can interpret it, then it's just a completely unknown tongue. And not only are you not speaking to anybody, but nobody can interpret it for the people who you are speaking to. So Paul's idea was, listen, if you're speaking in an unknown tongue, it should go to the people who, are, who speak that language. And if there's none of them there, not even one to interpret to everyone else who speaks, you know, the language that everyone else is speaking, then, um, then there's no point. He said that there's no edification in that. And most charismatic circles today, there is no interpretation of tongues. And even if there is interpretation, there's no way to know that that's actually what the interpretation is. Because they're, they're made up gibberish languages that, that aren't actual languages. There's no sign there. Miracles are signs. You can't prove a miracle. It's, it's pointless. It's, it's for nothing. That's, that's, that's the whole point of a miracle. Let's go on. So things had to be done decently in order. Um, there always had to be an interpreter. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 27. <clears throat> Paul says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, meaning a tongue that people here don't know. He's not saying a, a tongue that nobody on the earth knows, because again, there wouldn't be a sign, right? If he speaks in a tongue that nobody in the, in the congregation knows, it's unknown, let it be by two or at the most three. I don't want more than three people speaking in tongues in the service if, it's, if they're unknown. And that, by course, so one at a time, 
Don't get up there and everybody, you know, somebody's up on the platform speaking in tongues and then everyone else is like, ah, ba da ba da ba da ba You know, we don't need that. That's complete nonsense. That's what happens in charismatic churches, uh, many of them, right? I can't, I can't blanket coat all of them. I know some very great theologians who are charismatic who try to be very careful about this and they, they try to do it in a more biblical way. And I appreciate that. And I think, you know, these are brothers and sisters in Christ uh, for the most part, you know. And so I, I don't want to be overly critical. But it, I don't see this as being a biblical thing. This is not the way the Bible describes it, right? So they had to interpret. It says, verse 28, But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. You know, if you understand it, then go ahead and speak to yourself. Nobody else needs to hear it because nobody else is going to understand it. It's not going to do anything. It's supposed to be a sign to those who don't believe. It's not going to help if, uh, if, if nobody understands it. All right, um, so there's that. And then it says uh, these were to be um, a minor part of worship. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12. We're going, jumping around. But it's supposed to be a really tiny, minor part of the worship. It's not supposed to be the major part. 1 Corinthians um, 12, verse 28 uh, it says, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. So diversity of tongues is the very last thing. After just being helpful, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Tongues is like the, the lowest of the low. And that was the problem Paul is writing because they made tongues into this big, you know, look at me, I'm speaking in tongues thing. And Paul was saying, you know, that's not what, that's not what a spiritual gift is for. That's, that's, not, that's not the case. And by the way, there are many charismatics who will say that you are, not, you are not actually saved if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then started speaking in tongues. If you've never spoken in tongues, then you're not saved. They're, they're, that's taught in some charismatic uh, circles. Not in all of them, we'll be fair with them, but in some charismatic circles that's being taught, and that's, of course, very, very wrong. Um, even right here, it says, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak in, in tongues, in verse 30. So, clearly, not all do. That was a rhetorical question uh, that Paul's uh, hyperbole again. Um, also, there's no example ever, ever in the Bible of anyone speaking in the tongue of an angel. Never, ever, 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 not one time. You say, but 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, that was me pushing up my glasses, you know, a little nerdy, charismatic. And I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't pick on it, you know. Uh, but verse, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. I was having, I was struggling with the word. It's, remember, I was struggling with that word. It's hyperbole. This is clear hyperbole. Look at the next word, the next verse. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, right? Obviously, I don't understand all mysteries. Nobody understands every mystery. And nobody understands every, all knowledge. But he said, even if I did and had not charity, it would be nothing. And it's the same, he's using the same kind of language in verse 2 as he is in verse 1, where he says, I speak with the, though I speak with the tongues of men um, and of angels. That the angels is the extra one. That of course, nobody's going to speak in the tongue of angels. But even if I did and had not charity, it would be nothing. Just like nobody's going to have all, know all mysteries and have all knowledge. And of course, we would expect that nobody would speak in the tongues of angels because, again, miraculous things are a sign. Speaking in tongues of angels, is, is, it, you can't prove that that's miraculous. You can't go to an atheist and say, you know, shamala hamala, and they're going to be like, oh, oh, well, you obviously are speaking in the tongues of angels, so I believe now. And there's no way that, that's, that that can be a sign, right? Um, anyway, uh, we, we know that, sign, that tongues are for a sign for those who don't believe. Speaking in the tongues of angels wouldn't help that. Um, uh, so, here's my conclusion about tongues. Uh, these were signs um, to prove the new doctrine that was being taught by the church. Right? We see this from the get-go, from, from the day of Pentecost. This speaking in tongues proved that what they were saying was from God and not from them. It was proof of that. Um, so we have to ask ourselves the same questions we asked about prophecy. Do we see examples of tongues today that are biblical? Do we see tongues 
that are genuine provable signs. I don't know of any, and if you know of one, let me know. And I'll look it up and I'll find, and I'm, I'm open to looking at it. But I know of zero charismatics that have ever even claimed to be able to supernaturally speak in an actual tongue of any human being on the earth, which is what tongues were, right? That's what they were. I know of zero charisma. Now, uh, you know, I'm talking about they didn't know, you know, they can, they can show that they, that they never learned this tongue, and all of a sudden they can speak it. And we can prove that they're speaking it because it's an actual tongue that people actually know, that someone somewhere in the earth actually knows, and we can prove that. So, so do we see that anywhere, anywhere in those who speak in tongues, anywhere at all? No, we don't. We don't see it. But, but, but Pastor, Pastor, you know, you, the Bible never says it is going to cease. I'm going to tell you why I think the Bible doesn't say that they're going to cease. Okay, but we don't see them today. We know what they were. We know that we don't see that anywhere today. Right? So let's just be honest about that. We know what it was in the first century does not exist today. And what people claim to be tongues today is nothing like what we saw in the first century. Um, and and is, it seems very, very strange. Um, so do we see examples of tongues that are genuinely provable signs, that are not tongues of angels, and that are done decently and in order, always with an interpreter? I, even that, even when where churches try to do it decently in order and with an interpreter, that's very few and far between among charismatics. But it's still tongues of angels, right? Um, and it's not actual tongues. So we're not seeing the prophecy. When we ask the question about prophecy, what we see today is either just this pie in the sky, what, what's going to happen in your life in the next week or two type of prophecy that we can't judge with the scripture like Paul told them to judge prophecy. And if it was prophecy that can be judged with Scripture, it would be unnecessary because we have the Scripture, right? Um, and then when we're looking at tongues, we don't see the tongues that were in the first century today either. Um, man, I want to bring, bring this to some conclusions, but I, I, think, I, think I'll, I think this is a good place to stop because I have a few things to say about the gift of healing, because I made this statement a couple weeks ago that you never see anyone other than an apostle healing anyone uh, using the gift of healing. And there is kind of an exception to that. And that would be uh, the deacon Philip when he went to Samaria. He is, um, he is preaching the gospel and demons are cast out and people are healed, it says. So we're going to talk about that and talk about maybe a little bit about the healing side of things, which I don't think is going to be a long discussion because there's really only one example we have in the scripture, and then everything else in scripture says, you know, it's not a gift, just pray for them. If they're sick, just pray for them, you know. So we're going to talk about that next week, and then that'll give us, that'll be short, so I think that'll give us time to then draw some conclusions and find out and, and ask, we'll have to ask the question, I'd, I'd like you to kind of be thinking about it over the next week if you can. Um, why is it that the Bible doesn't just tell us, hey, these are just going to be around for until the apostles are gone and then, then they're gone. Why is that? I want you to ask that question to yourself. And I'm going to attempt to provide an answer that I think just makes so much sense because that's all my answers do, you know. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm going to attempt to, to, to answer that next week. Any questions um, other than the one that I asked you, told you I'm going to answer next week? <laughs> Right. So that, that gets into a, a little bit of a more in-depth conversation. You'd probably want at that point to talk to say, uh, do you have time maybe, you know, just sit down for half an hour and we can, we, and I can show you some of the evidence? Because really it's going to be a longer conversation at that point. Um, but when you're, there is, there is the way the historians look at the Bible, it's, it's provable. We, um, atheist historians, the the majority, and in most cases, the, what we say is the consensus, meaning it's like over 90-some percent of, of historians, atheists, agnostic, whatever they are, all agree. And here's a good example. We'll go to the resurrection of Christ because that's the miracle that kind of proves all the other miracles, right? That's the, if you can prove that one, right, that's, that's the mother load, right? Um, the consensus among historians, they, they all agree that Jesus was a real person, 
and that he really lived and he really died um, on, by crucifixion by the Romans. There's, there's, there's like one out of a million historians disagrees with that. They all agree. Atheists, whatever, right? They all agree that the, that the tomb was found empty. They, they know that because when they're looking at the things that, that were written, these, the, the apostles are writing down that the women found the tomb. Well, if you were making up a story that you wanted people to believe, you wouldn't say the women found it because in their culture, it, I'm not saying this is right, okay, in their culture, the, the testimony of a woman was worth less than the testimony of a man. You, if, if all you had to, to prove something in court was the testimony of a woman, the case would be thrown out. It's wrong, right? It's not the Bible doesn't say that's the way it should be, right? That's not what the Bible says. That's just how they. That's just their culture. So in their culture, they would never say that it was Mary Magdalene and it was you know that found that was the first one who saw Jesus and never. If they were making up a story, they most certainly wouldn't do that. And also, um, the the Jews hated the Christians, and all they had to do to stamp out this Christianity thing would be to open up the tomb and to show them the body. It clearly was empty. The tomb was clearly empty. So historians all agree, Jesus was a real person. He really lived. He really died by crucifixion of the Romans. His tomb was really found empty. And then they're all scratching their heads because here's these bunch of fishermen from Galilee who, who are scared to death. And all of a sudden now they they're all go to the death convinced that this is true. And, and, and they're just, they're writing things embarrassing about themselves. They're not making stuff up. They're writing things that they're convinced are true. And they all die for this thing. And they all lose every bit of property and every bit of popularity and everything they've ever had. And they all die saying, no, 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 I won't recant. Jesus resurrected. So historians all agree Jesus was real. He really died. His tomb was really found empty. And his followers really believed that they saw the resurrected Christ. So historians, when they look at this, they find all these facts and they say, we can't figure out why. Eh, maybe it was a hallucination. Really? You have 500 people all hallucinating the same thing at the same time? That's, that's, that's just that's scientifically impossible. There's no way. You, know, you, don't, you don't have hallucinations. And by the way, the, they even were not prone to believe in hallucinations. Peter was uh, in the... Remember when Peter was let out of prison? And, uh, and the first thing he thought when he got out of prison, when the angel let him out of prison, first thing he thought was, this is some sort of dream. I'm not really being let out of prison. He doesn't, he's inclined not to believe miraculous things. He thinks instinctively this is some sort of vision. This is a hallucination, right? I'm just hallucinating something. This isn't real. And then he's like, I'm really here. And then he goes to the house. And what do the, people, the church say? Oh, it's just a ghost. You're seeing things, you know? They don't want to believe it. They're not inclined to believe crazy things. They, they in, are inclined to think hallucination. If they had hallucinated Jesus, that would be the first thing they would have thought, which is why Jesus, when he was there, ate bread with them to show them this is not hallucination. They were all going to think that. And, and they were convinced that it wasn't because of what Jesus did. So anyway, the point is that you can go from peace to peace. You can go to the Old Testament prophecies and you can show how there's very clear prophecies about destructions of certain cities that happened exactly the way it was going to happen. And you can, you can show this and, and there's a lot of historical evidence, but it's a longer conversation, right? It's, it's a let's sit down and go over all the, all the evidence and... And, and before we do, let me, let me call pastor and have him email me, all, you know. <laughs> but but there, is, there is evidence. And, and don't back down on that. If somebody says, oh, there's no evidence, most people say, well, you know, I just believe. No, don't, don't do that. Just say, no, there is. And if you ever are willing to actually investigate and look at it, I can, I can provide it to you. And you'll be shocked. You'll be, you'll be, you'll not, your socks will be knocked right off. And I think that's really the, the problem. People don't, people don't disbelieve the Bible because they've researched it. They disbelieve the Bible because they researched it and just are, con just are just determined not to believe it or because they just haven't actually done the research um, because this, the evidence is all there. Anyway, that was a long answer to a question. <laughs> Any other questions uh, about anything, but more specifically about the, <laughs> about the gifts of the Spirit? Okay, well, that's a good place to stop, and uh, we'll have one more week, and then we'll move on, to, move on to the offices of the church. I'd like to get on to, you know, what is it that's required of pastors, what's required of deacons, what's required of, 
of the officers in the church. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So let's pray and we'll go. Father, what a, what a privilege it is to be a part of your church and to know that you're doing a great work. Uh, we, are, we are convinced of the truth of what we believe. We, 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 aren't just, we don't just believe it because we want to believe it. We are absolutely convinced based on the actual evidence that you've provided that this is true. And we thank you for that. We pray that you would help us as we um, declare this to the world, not to be ashamed or to back down when people laugh at us and think that we're ignorant because we know this is true. This, this is proven factual truth. And what a wonderful thing to know that uh, this is. And what help us as we study these issues, Lord, help our, our good friends and brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ who, who are in the charismatic movement. We pray that you'd help them to see what we see. And if not, help us to be kind and generous and, and compassionate to them in, uh, uh, even though we, we see these things differently. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name.